Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Droulis in Hong Kong. The top stories this hour. Asian stocks face pressure after Wall Street's fourth session of declines. That's the longest losing run since January. Dip buys, though, emerging in the Treasuries market. President Biden works to win the votes of union workers, promising U.S. steel will stay American-owned and saying he made triple tariffs on Chinese imports. And investors are waiting TSMC's earnings with its CapEx outlook the key to potentially extending a $340 billion stock surge. Take a look at how we're setting up when it comes to the start of trading in this part of the world. And of course, we're an hour away from the start of trading in Australia, Japan, uh, and also, uh, of course, looking ahead to, to trading in the Chinese markets as well, given those threats of potentially uh, more serious uh, tariff implications uh, from President Biden. But take a look at futures for Sydney. We're looking like a little bit of upside, about three tenths of one percent higher. We are getting uh, labour market data out a little bit later, expected to show any employment falling in March. We had that big surge in February, we're expecting about a 25,000 job decrease, according to Bloomberg Economics. We're also getting BHP and Santos reporting their quarterly numbers as well. So watching out for those when trading begins. Kiwi stocks are already down by just about 1%. We're seeing a pretty muted uh, session for Chicago Nikkei futures at the moment. But as I said, uh, we're sort of watching to see broadly uh, Bell Asian stocks coming under pressure after we saw US stocks just extending that losing streak. Yeah, actually, the longest losing streak, as we said, we've seen since January. But interesting session as well. You've got futures here just coming online, uh, fairly muted at this point in time. But it was that story of, yes, another day of weakness. So the S&P 500, for instance, is now down around 4% from its record high. Big tech uh, really bearing the brunt of this as well. There has been a lot of question marks over how much, or there had been a lot of question marks over how much further the market could go over the nearer term. But it is really that digesting of the Fed message, we are going to be staying high for longer. Uh, Treasury yields as well, they fell. We actually had a weaker dollar in the session. But still, uh, that is the outlook as we come online. And let's uh, discuss where markets go from here, bringing our first guest of the day. That's Burns McKinney, Senior Portfolio Manager, NFJ Investment Group, joining us now. Uh, Burns, I was taking a look at your notes, and, and really it just seems like investors should expect low returns higher volatility, at least in the nearer term. That's correct. Uh, again, I think you noted that, that what the markets have been doing over the last couple of days has been really kind of consolidating around some of the latest statements from Jay Powell. Um, you know, I think that's probably the biggest driver of equities over the past week and probably over the coming quarter, whereby you know, inflation has been stubbornly sticky this year so far. And as a result, you did have Chairman Powell talk about um, that you know they have the patience to maybe uh, wait a while before they cut rates, and as a result, you've seen the market started this year expecting you know six or seven rate cuts, and now they're pricing in one or two uh, at best. Um, the good news is that the markets have done a pretty good job, I mean, notwithstanding the last few days, of of really digesting and handling this. Uh, when one considers that um, stocks are still up from where they were um, last fall, when interest rates were about the same level. Uh, so, you know, equities have done well. Corporate earnings have been fairly strong. And despite the fact this rate tightening cycle began a couple of years ago, and, you know, there is a lag to that. The economy has handled this pretty well when one considers that um, the unemployment rate, for example, in the U.S. is has been below 4 percent for over two years now. It's actually the longest streak of unemployment being this low in over 50 years. And so, you know, because the economy has been fairly solid, it does give the Fed the ability to be patient. It's sort of like if one if you're on a road trip and your car's getting a little better mileage than you were expecting, you can make it a few more exits before you have to make a pit stop. But that does mean higher for longer interest rates. It would suggest higher volatility, as you noted. Um, and really, it probably suggests that investors should maybe focus a little bit more on shorter duration financial instruments. This really isn't a great scenario for some of the highest growth tech names. But it does bode well for you know, possibly being a catalyst for um, a reversion to mean towards value equities that tend to be shorter duration. Uh, it could be very positive for value stocks and, and dividend pairs as well. We can get to value stocks in just a moment, but I do want to mention what you said around big tech there and the outlook, because this is also the other big 
potential catalyst from where we go from here. There are a number of big tech earnings coming out over the the coming days. You've got the likes of Meta, uh, NVIDIA, Amazon, I mean, lots of different names. But the point is, uh, what are you expecting? And are we going to see really that, that strength in, in big tech continue, do you think, given that even though we have had high rates, a lot of it's been on that AI theme instead? And the AI theme has really been the primary driver of equities this year, despite the fact that interest rates have risen. The fact that stocks are up as well really, I think, results from the fact that you had um, a lot of these big tech names. If you look at the last quarter, NVIDIA, they had high earnings expectation baked in. They beat those. They had their um, investor conference whereby they introduced new products. And, you know, they've really boosted a lot of the investor optimism around that. That said, um, you know, a lot of these names, they really are, um, they really do have very optimistic scenarios priced in. And so when we look at big tech, um, you know, we're probably suggesting that investors is probably the time to be a little bit choosier. And it is a sector for which you know, not all names are created equal. It is a sector for which you have a lot of cash on balance sheets. You have low dividend payout ratios. So you have room for uh, future growth. And you do have a lot of um, long-term secular benefits, such as you know, growth in e-commerce, as well as demand for cloud computing and AI. So um, there definitely are some opportunities to be had there. Burns, when you take a look at the growing divergence uh, that we are expecting when it comes to monetary policy and, and the rates environment, do you see more potential in Asia with, uh, in particular, the, the favorable currency effect? The, the currency effects could certainly um, definitely, you know, act, uh, you know, as a beneficiary. That said, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, with, um, you know, with interest rates potentially being higher for longer, that really does, you know, means a stronger dollar. It actually gives a boost to exports from other uh, other countries. And so when we look at U.S. investors, it probably would be a positive for, for multinationals. And it can definitely be, uh, you know, a nice, uh, you know, solid benefit for countries that are you know, export oriented and a little bit more cyclical, whether that be you know, some of the export oriented economies in places like Europe and you know, countries like Germany. And it could you know, continue to give the, the boost to Japan, which has really been one of the biggest winners over the past year. When you're looking domestically, are you looking for any companies that might have exposure to Asia, to China in particular? I noticed that Starbucks is one of your picks and obviously uh, they have a lot of investment when it comes to the Chinese market. Yeah, we're looking at domestic stocks that have that Asian exposure, it's really it's not necessarily we're looking for names that that that, that might benefit from China. Rather, uh, those are the names because of the slow reopening of the economy in China. Um, a lot of companies that do have exposure there, they've just gotten hit pretty hard on earnings, and as a result, they've just gotten cheaper. A lot of the expectations have have come down. And so, if you look at a name like Starbucks, as a result of um, the fact that they do get a, a substantial amount of sales in China. Uh, the stock is is really as cheap as it's as it's been that we can recall. Um, you know, right now you can get Starbucks. It's a you know premium growth name at a discount to the S and P 500. It's right now that PE multiple on the name. Without you know, with the exception of a, a brief period during the pandemic, it hasn't been this cheap in the last 30 years, 20. I'm sorry, uh, 10 years. And you know, you have a company that they've been you know very generous with returning capital to shareholders. They've grown the dividend by. Um, you know, high double-digit rates for a decade. Um, so that's a great way to keep up with inflation. And uh, I, I just on a personal level, I look at it, you know, it's the type of name they have pricing power because they sell a, a legal and addictive product. And uh, it's a place where my daughter does her homework there. My son meets his friends there. It's you know, really kind of position themselves as being the, the town square of the 21st century. Burns, you mentioned value equities perhaps ready to turn a corner. Can you just give us more insights in, into the, the sectors perhaps that you're looking at or, or different industries? Well, just looking at value equities as a whole, the, the best case you could make, make for them is reversion of the mean, which you know, in finance is one of the, the most rock solid rules there is. And you know, we live in a world in which you know, last year, the U.S. value index trailed the growth index by 30 percentage points. Historically, when that happens over the last several decades, usually value outperforms growth about three quarters of the time over the subsequent year. The discount of the value index, it's right now trading at nearly a 50 percent discount to the growth index. That's typically more like a, you know, a, a 25 percent discount. So you have valuation on your side. You have the fact that they've lagged and you know the one thing you need is a catalyst and that catalyst could be 
interest rates being a little bit higher for longer. So, you know, we like value uh, names really across all industries. But that said, you know, if you want to think about some more specific areas, um, you know, defensives are actually starting to look good. You know, going back a year ago, uh, investors were just you know, dead certain we were going to have a recession. And as a result, they piled into the defensives. Um, they got expensive. Well, you know, going back towards the end of uh, 2023, investors pretty much at this point aren't pricing in any risk of recession at all. And so th those defensives that would defend capital in that instance um, have been largely dumped. It's sort of the way we say it is that um, you know, when it's sunny outside, no one's shopping for umbrellas. You can get them on the cheap. And so you know, areas like utilities is one space that investors have really fled as you can get some um, solid values there. Burns, always great to have you with us. Burns McKinney, Senior Portfolio Manager at NFJ Investment Group. Still ahead on Daybreak, a look at how the Fed's wait-and-see approach is boosting the dollar. Barclay sharing their outlook for FX later. But first, the IMF says the US and China and their levels of debt will pose risks for global public finances. That is next. This is Bloomberg. India's elections kick off with a focus on the economy, social divisions, and climate change actions that will influence the global story. Bloomberg is live on location with the latest updates from the world's largest democracy. Coverage begins April 19th. The International Monetary Fund has issued a fresh warning about the risks coming from U.S. and Chinese debt. The fund says the two great economic rivals will drive much of the increase in global public debt over the next five years, with their own obligations nearly doubling over the next 30 years. Let's bring our senior U.S. economy editor, Chris Ansley, who joins us now. So, Chris, where does the IMF see the risks deriving from? Uh, well, in the United States, uh, one thing that we are hearing from not just the IMF, but uh, a number of delegations uh, here in the uh, Washington spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank uh, is that U the U.S. fiscal stance uh, is really uh, out of whack uh, if you consider that the economy is growing strongly, if you consider that the U.S. is effectively at full employment. Uh, it is extraordinary that they are on course to run a $1.6 trillion deficit uh, and something that uh, has consequences for the rest of the world is, of course, uh, the transmission channel of uh, big U.S. deficits, higher inflation, stronger growth, stronger dollar. That makes it more difficult for everybody else to pay back dollar obligations, especially if you're uh, the likes of uh, developing and emerging markets. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and then on the China side, uh, there is concern about uh, the overall level of debt, especially at the local government level, uh, and uh, increasing questions about China's long-term growth prospects and the ability uh, to sustain that debt load. Yeah, and, and then how do those issues within China and that larger than expected slowdown, how does that also have, have ramifications for the rest of the world? What are the implications here? Well, the implications are uh, that uh, many of the countries that had been supplying uh, China's uh, real estate engine, for example, uh, think uh, Chilean copper, uh, think, uh, you know, Brazilian commodities, uh, the demand is not likely to be uh, what it had been. Uh, and in the meantime, you've got uh, a debt load in China uh, that raises, uh, you know, potential uh, transmission channels uh, through, uh, through through finance as well. Uh, we're seeing uh, the uh, Chinese yuan, uh, you know, pushing uh, towards uh, 7.3 per dollar. Uh, you know, many uh, countries uh, have exchange rates uh, that are uh, tied to the yuan. Uh, so uh, it means uh, exchange rate uh, depreciation pressure. Uh, it means uh, less of an export gain, uh, so a host of different concerns. 
All right, that was our senior U.S. economy editor there, Chris Anstey. And some breaking news just crossing the terminal here. This relates to more details on U.S. funding for major chip makers. It's all part of this effort by the Biden administration to bring semiconductor production back to American soil. And we've just had the latest recipient or, or details of perhaps the latest recipient, because this is according to people f familiar with the matter. But Micron is poised to get over $6 billion in chips aren't Act grants next week. The award, as we said, it's not yet finalised, but it could be announced within the coming days. Uh, not clear as well whether the company plans to accept loans. They would be available through the 2022 Chips and Science Act, in addition to what is this direct grant funding. Uh, as we said, the Chips Act, it set around nearly $40 billion for direct grants, as well as loans and loan guarantees. That's worth $75 billion, but $39 billion going toward direct grants and Micron poised to get about $6 billion worth of this. There's been a number of different chip companies that have been unveiled as preliminary recipients so far. The likes of Intel, TSMC, Samsung as well was one we had earlier this week. So that is the state of play. Micron, as we said, uh, poised to get over $6 billion in chip grants next week. And it really does come as that tension, that race for, for tech supremacy between the U.S. and China. And on that point, uh, President Biden has called China xenophobic, highlighting the Asian nation's economic woes as he sought to make the case for U.S. economic strength during a campaign stop in Pennsylvania. While overall relations between the two nations have stabilised of late, uh, tensions are growing over Chinese investments in manufacturing. They've got a population that is more people in retirement than working. They're not, in, they're not importing any. They're not bringing... They're, they're xenophobic. No, nobody coming else coming in. They've got real problems. Well, the president also vowed to keep U.S. steel American-owned and threatened higher tariffs on Chinese steel as he seeks to win over union workers ahead of the November election. U.S. steel has been an iconic American company for more than a century, and it should remain a totally American company. Yeah! American-owned, American-operated by American union steel workers, the best in the world, and it's, that's going to happen, I promise you. Well, more, let's bring our global business editor, Karen Lee. So what's in it for President Biden? What's in it for the union? And can they sort of come to an agreement? Well, Heidi, let's take a step back and look at what's happening, especially in the context of the election in November. Biden wants to woo the union. He wants their support. At the same time, U.S. steel shareholders have approved a $14 billion takeover effort, uh, takeover bid by Nippon Steel, which is a Japanese company. Um, so Biden's been hitting the ground running in Pennsylvania this week. His, he wants the support of the state. He wants to win it. It's a big swing state. Um, but at the same time, this is now going to go to politicians and regulators. So whether this is going to be something that moves markets, whether this is more of a political stance, is yet to be seen. And Karen, we've heard as well uh, President Biden really pushing for tariffs on, on Chinese steel, for instance. But let's just take a listen to what he said on the campaign trail. Look, right now... My U.S. trade representative is investigating trade practices by the Chinese government regarding steel and aluminum. If that investment confirms these anti-competitive trade practices, then I'm calling on her to consider tripling the tariff rates for both steel and aluminum for some time. So give us some more context on this, because I think part of the, the question around tariffs is how, how substantive is it? Yeah, well, Biden's proposed a 25% Levi on certain um, Chinese steel and aluminum products, and that's meant to shore up U.S. steel. Um, it's meant to court the workers, but at the same time, Bloomberg's being told that this could be more of a political statement. It might make, it might have no market impact at all. Um, and the Chinese steel imports are just a small sliver of the U.S. steel market. So what we're really going to be looking at is what this does for Biden in terms of his support among the workers going into November's election. Um, because he does have the backing of the union, but at the same time, so does Donald Trump. He's got a lot of support among the rank and file. And this is something that both of these candidates want to win going into November. 
A global business editor Karen Lee there. Meanwhile, China's Commerce Ministry has blasted a Biden administration plan for a formal review of its maritime, logistics and shipbuilding sector. The U.S. Trade Representative's office announced the investigation after a petition from five major union groups. Beijing says the review wrongly frames normal trade and investment as being harmful to the U.S. and is being driven by domestic politics. You can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find that at Daybigo. It's also available on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise those settings as well to get the news on the industries and assets that matter to you. This is Bloomberg. UBS is said to be planning another round of job cuts as the firm continues to trim headcount following its rescue of Credit Suisse. A Bloomberg Finance editor Adam Haig joins us now with the details. And Adam, this is going to affect a number of different business units. Yes, but as we understand, it's, it's mostly in, in investment banking, right? So um, this is essentially going beyond the usual pruning of the, you know, kind of the, the bottom 5 or 10%, the underperformance. This is more about the continued restructure. Um, following the, the absorption of, of Credit Suisse and what it shows is that still globally, Heidi, there's still more work to be done in terms of you know, tweaking the teams and the resources that, in the, that they need at UBS. They're still going through the process of understanding exactly where they want to highlight as, as being the priority areas and this is kind of another example of that. So interesting to see that this is um, you know, fairly wide scale. It will be quite a, 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 you know, a sizable number of, of people. Um, but yeah, just another example of how this integration is, is really taking quite some time still. Mm -hmm. Adam, which, which areas are going to be most impacted? We know investment banking, but possibly also wealth management, market units. Who's sort of, mm, for want of a better phrase, on the chopping board here? Yeah, well, certainly investment banking will seems to be the main area of focus for, for this round of, of cuts, Annabelle. But, um, of course, that there are some adjustments still being made in, in wealth management. And, and as we know, in, in places like Australia, you know, the wealth management business for, for UBS is still really, really a, a strong core area that they're wanting to build out. So you really still do need to see this in the context of the integration of, of Credit Suisse, but, but growth areas that that UBS are still wanting to highlight, like Australia for wealth management, like places uh, in, in, up in Asia and places like India for, for wealth management. So there are still the growth areas alongside uh, some of these more um, you know, traditional areas like investment banking, which of course is, is still a very pressured area of global finance at the moment. So you, you, do, you would expect that there are still some um, further adjustments to be made uh, as they bring on board all the people from Credit Suisse. All right, that was our Bloomberg Finance Editor, Adam Hay, there with our scoop on UBS. And uh, just a couple of lines that are crossing the terminal. We've got Fed Reserve Governor Bowman commenting at an event in Washington. And a couple of different headlines are dropping from this as well. Chief among them is that he's saying progress on inflation could have stalled. And that's really uh, sort of been the big question mark and, and really speaks to what we've been hearing from the likes of Jay Powell, for instance, saying that inflation is taking a little bit longer than expected to come down that so-called last mile of disinflation very much in play. But time will tell. That's another line he's saying. Time will tell if policy is sufficiently restrictive. Uh, we did actually see Treasury yields dropping in the prior session. We'll mark them again when Tokyo reopens in about 30 minutes from now. But coming up, Barclays shares their outlook on FX markets as a resurgent dollar cuts a swathe through Asian currencies. This is Bloomberg. Time for morning calls ahead of the Asian Trading Day. An economist at Citigroup are going out on a limb by wagering that virtually everyone on Wall Street is wrong about the Fed. Andrew Hollenhurst and Veronica Clark are sticking to their forecasts for five quarter point cuts this year. 
They say policymakers are eager to seize on any signs of disinflation or economic weakness. Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, they've all dialed back their rate forecasts for this year. And traders in the interest rate futures market are also piling into a contrarian bet. That's happening in the futures on the secured overnight financing rate, which closely tracks the Fed's key policy rate. It involves buying the December 2024 contract while selling the one that's due in December 2025. Scenarios in which that trade stands to gain include the Fed front-loading rate cuts before the presidential election in November and more aggressively easing than it's currently priced in to markets, Heidi. Uh, and of course, there's so much debate going on in terms of the noise around Fed expectations and whether, in fact, by signalling a pivot to rate cuts towards the end of last year, that perhaps this is part of the reason why we're seeing that uh, stickiness and the stubbornness when it comes to the inflation now. But uh, of course, we continue to monitor that as our top story driving market moves. We're seeing a little bit of upside there going into the open in about half an hour's time. Sydney up about three tenths of one percent. Elsewhere, though, looking pretty meek, to be honest. Kiwi stocks accelerating losses down by 1.1% there. We're also seeing a Singapore Nikkei futures looking uh, a little bit to the downside, about half a percent. And we have a little bit of breathing space when it comes to Asian currencies. But certainly uh, these latest comments from the likes of Bowman, from the likes of Mester as well, uh, time will tell if policy is sufficiently restrictive uh, that progress on inflation may have stalled. We'll continue to kind of uh, reprice that outlook for the Fed and that'll play out, no doubt, when it comes to Asian FX weakness. Dollar yen trading at 154 at the moment. We're certainly pulled back a bit from the 155 plus levels that we saw in the previous session, but the dollar is taking a bit of a breather there after multiple sessions of gains. The Aussie dollar at 64.40. We do get uh, numbers out of Santos and BHP later on today, as well as labour market indicators out of Australia after the big surge in jobs gains that we saw in February. We are expecting that pullback in those March numbers. Uh, watching dollar yuan as well, given uh, the remarks that we heard from President Biden about uh, potentially an acceleration of steel tariffs on China. Let's bring in Mitchell Katecha on the subject of FX. He's a head of FX and Ian Macro Strategy Asia at Barclays. Mitchell, great to have you with us. So we have a little bit of respite for Asian FX, but given the direction that we see when it comes to US rates and the inflation picture, do you expect to see further strength for the, for the dollar? Well, I think um, there's a couple of things here. I mean, certainly dollar sentiment has shifted uh, sharply positive positioning and sentiment, especially against G10 currencies. So that may limit the ability of the dollar to move too much higher from here. But you know, we talked about the Fed, and clearly there has been a massive repricing of uh, U.S. interest rate expectations. U.S. Treasury yields have been shifting higher continuously almost in recent weeks. And that, again, has been helping to propel the dollar higher. It's hard to see that reverse anytime soon. So even if the dollar doesn't move higher with the same sort of momentum, it is likely to continue to remain firm in the weeks ahead, which does put a lot of, you know, we talk about Asia, but a lot of Asia, Asian currencies on the back foot, especially those that have lower yields that don't have that sort of interest rate protection. So it does look like we're still going to be in this environment for the time being. We have uh, cut our own uh, Fed uh, easing expectations as well. We now only expect the Fed to cut once this year in September, although there is a good chance they may even delay that to December. And again, that uh, pullback in easing expectations again adds support to the US dollar. We've seen a couple of attempts by China to kind of loosen its grip when it comes to trading ranges for the yuan, right? Do you expect to see this as, as an ongoing theme? Because really moves in the yuan have been almost as impactful as, as the moves that we've seen in the dollar when it comes to Asian FX. That's right. Look, the, the, the peg or the very, very tight fixings that uh, the PBOC has maintained in recent months have provided an anchor for regional currencies. But this anchor is proving difficult to hold. As the dollar strengthens, uh, the fixing has to probably move higher uh, to avoid this uh, breach of the 2% band uh, without having to intervene significantly. So while China does have enough ammunition to maintain uh, stability of the currency, it is losing out from a competitive perspective. The CFET's trade-weighted index continues to move higher, above 99 in our view. 
And that is adding more and more pressure in terms of competitive pressures at a time when exports are weakening and uh, there's ongoing deflation in China. So if anything, it means that, that China will probably have to loosen up its grip on the currency in the weeks ahead, allowing somewhat more depreciation and probably less trade weighted gains in the currency. And, and Middle, t talk to us about the interplay that we see between the, the dollar yuan and also the dollar yen, the weakness that we see in Japan's currency. Well, again, that is adding to that pressure, right? Because dollar yen continues to move higher. And again, there's no real, apart from intervention risks, there doesn't seem to be really much to stop that move higher in dollar yen when interest rate differentials continue to widen. Again, that adds pressure on China. Clearly, it's not just the yen, but you look at, for example, dollar Korea, which has also moved higher. Um, again, the trade weighted perspective means that the yuan is richening on a trade weighted perspective, especially as the yen continues to weaken. So as dollar yen moves higher, in our view, that just adds more and more pressure uh, for dollar yuan to also move higher in the days and the weeks ahead. So our forecast uh, for dollar yuan was 7.30 uh, by end of this quarter. The reality is that with these moves in uh, FX that we're seeing at present, uh, we may hit that forecast much sooner than anticipated. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it's going to be very, very difficult to keep on fixing uh, so strongly uh, the currency for, for PBOC. Yeah, and, and of course, currency currency concerns have, have been at the IMF meetings because, for instance, on the sidelines of those, we've been hearing or we've got the readout from that meeting between the finance chiefs of the US, Japan, Korea. Uh, what are the steps really, do you think, or what options are available to currency chiefs in Japan and Korea to, to arrest the slide in, in the won and the yen? Well, I, I think it's very difficult because this is, after all, a U.S.-led move. It's a U.S. rates, dollar-led move. It's also a risk aversion move. You know, we've seen risk appetite having deteriorated fairly sharply in recent weeks because of a plethora of concerns in markets, whether it's the Middle East, rising commodity prices, or just the fact that the Fed may not cut as much as expected. But that is adding to that dollar strength. So in reality, uh, Yes, central banks in Asia can intervene, and we are already seeing uh, significant interventions across the region, and that's probably obscuring some of that dollar upside against Asian currencies, and hence why we're seeing more dollar upside against some of the G10 currencies. But again, there's only a limited amount of ammunition you can throw at this move uh, when the dollar continues to be as robust as it is. So the other option, of course, is interest rate hikes. Uh, we've just put out a, a piece yesterday highlighting that, for example, Bank Indonesia now may need to hike rates to give some support to its currency. But again, this may all prove fairly limited as the dollar continues to strengthen. Uh, and even for Japan, if we do see BOJ intervention, yes, dollar yen could move lower. We anticipate on average that move in intervention ends up being about a 3% move in dollar yen. But again, it may be short lived. And we all, uh, I understand, and speaking from a number of investors, it may just provide better levels for uh, clients or investors to go back into long dollar yen positions. So it, it may be only temporary if we do see intervention from these central banks. Yeah, and as you said, possible rate hike from the Reserve Bank of Indonesia to shore up its currency. Is that something as well that you're seeing possible for, for India's central bank as well? I think India's in a in a somewhat better position. Um, you know, India is benefiting still from very strong capital inflows, uh, both on the bond and equity side. And I think India, if anything, the RBI has actually been buying dollars in recent months. And despite that dollar INR, yes, it's moved higher, but not significantly so. So we continue to look for uh, Indian rupee outperformance. We actually hold trade recommendations to buy the rupee versus CNH and Taiwan dollar. Uh, just based on that view that the rupee will continue to do better. So we don't really see risks of a rate hike in India. Uh, admittedly, the RBI is not moving quickly to cut rates either. and We're watching uh, inflation uh, evolution in India. But again, we think as we move into the second half of this year, possibly into the later into the third quarter, we could see a rate cut from the uh, RBI, but certainly no prospects of hikes to protect the currency in India. It is very much something that we may see in Indonesia, as, uh, as I mentioned, but unlikely to see that, for example, being replicated in India.
Jack Mitil Kachetcha there, head of FX and EM Macro Strategy Asia at Barclays. Thanks very much for your time this morning. And let's get back to a breaking story that came out in just the last 10 minutes or so, but it relates to Micron, and you are seeing that stock there climbing in after hours so far. Uh, what we're hearing is that it could be set to receive a very large amount in grants from the Commerce Department in the US to help pay for domestic factory projects. But uh, we want to bring in... Mackenzie Hawkins. He actually is the person on that scoop for us today. So Mackenzie, thanks very much for joining us. Talk us through it because we've heard a number of different uh, companies already being announced as preliminary recipients, but, but Micron now also. So Micron would be the seventh announcement that the Biden administration has made from this massive U.S. push to subsidize semiconductor companies to build factories in the U.S. Micron has pledged to build as many as four fabs to produce chips in upstate New York. They're also planning to build a $15 billion facility in their home state of Idaho. And they are one of 600 companies that expressed interest in this roughly $50 billion program from the U.S. government. Um, and they are in line to receive a very significant sum of money. It could be announced as soon as next week um, to subsidize some of those factories that they're building to produce computer memory chips in the United States. Um, the Commerce Department has already announced significant awards for Samsung, uh, for TSMC, the world's top chip maker, um, and Intel. All of those awards also north of $6 billion, with Intel capturing the most. And some of the companies receiving multiple billions of dollars worth of loans as well, and some awards for old generation chips. So we're already seeing a lot of federal funding in really just a couple of these past few weeks start to finally flow out the door um, with these preliminary award agreements coming from the U.S. government as one of the world's most powerful technology companies. We know that there are multiple factories being planned and Micron has four of them uh, just for itself, but do these grants potentially only support the ones that were going to production sooner? So, as I said, there are 600 companies that have expressed interest in this funding, um, and the Commerce Department, which is administering the U.S. CHIPS program, has some really difficult decisions to make. And so Secretary Raimondo said a couple of weeks ago that they're going to prioritize projects that will be in production by 2030. A lot of these factories, which many of the, the biggest ones are on actually delayed timelines, sometimes by a quarter, sometimes by multiple years from some of Micron's competitors here, but the Secretary has said, we're putting a cap on it. We're going to prioritize projects that will be in production by the end of the decade. And they've attached a lot of their goals, such as producing 20 percent of the world's advanced logic chips, to that 2030 deadline. And so Micron's New York project, which the firm has said could be up to a $100 billion investment, contingent on U.S. support, um, two of those factories are set to be done by 2029, two of them not until 2041. So what we're hearing is that it's very likely that the Commerce Department funding is going to be designed to support the first two factories, but not the second. Mackenzie, I mean, we can say that there's no such thing as a free lunch here. So are there any strings that are attached to this funding, given that this is also about the U.S. making sure that it stays competitive and ahead of China in chip making efforts? Certainly. So each of these awards, I mean, it's hashed out between the Commerce Department, brought in some bankers from Wall Street who are used to uh, negotiating these type of deals with companies to hash out the awards over months and months of negotiation. And the announcement that Micron is expected to have next week, this is the case for all of the announcements the Commerce Department has made so far, is just a preliminary agreement. They're not actually going to receive any money. Then they will enter months of due diligence, continue to hash out specific benchmarks on which they will receive the money over time. So the first check that they get is not going to be for more than $6 billion. It'll be for some fraction of that once they hit a certain construction or production milestone. And they'll continue to get money over time as they hit additional milestones that are negotiated specific to individual factories. There's also always the possibility that the Commerce Department could claw back some of the money. If Micron doesn't meet the goals that it said it will for whatever stage of the grant process, the U.S. government has written into statute, into the CHIPS Act law, that they have the ability to take the money back. Um, so there are lots and lots of strings attached for these companies. That's in part why it takes so long to hash out these agreements. And it'll be really important to watch over time when those, that funding actually starts flowing out the door. U.S. industrial policy reporter Mackenzie Hawkins there with that story on Micron. We do have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg.
for some of the corporate stories we're tracking and a couple of Bloomberg scoops as well. And we've learned that Saudi Arabia's Neom City project is planning its debut real bond sale for later this year. That's as it looks for more funding sources for the $1.5 trillion worth of construction projects that are planned. Sources tell us that Neom's appointed banks, including HSBC, to advise on the sale of Islamic bonds, which could raise as much as $1.3 billion. And documents seen by Bloomberg show Jane Street generated over $10 billion in net trading revenue last year. That was among financial markets the firm or makers rather the firm disclosed to investors as part of a debt deal that it's seeking. It's a very rare glimpse into the mechanics of the notoriously secretive firm, which has steadily expanded to make markets in areas including ETFs, stocks, currencies, derivatives and bonds as well. And JP Morgan CEO J Jamie Dimon has been laying out his vision for the future of money in an AI world. Bloomberg Originals spoke exclusively with Dimon to kick off season two of The Circle with Emily Cheng. She asked him about the opportunities and the risks that are ahead. The best thing is be prepared for any business. Think When you think about risk, think about things that can go terribly wrong, can you survive them? You know, it could be technology, it could be government regulations, it could be, uh, it could be the, literally the weather. If you're a restaurant, you know, that might close you down. If you, know, you, have, if you lose this week's business, you're out of business, you don't have enough cash. So you should think all that through. Bill Gates once said, banking is necessary, banks are not. To what extent could AI or fintech replace traditional banks? So I think, first of all, I remember him saying banks are dinosaurs. I spoke to him about it in 1997, and he, obviously he was dead wrong. He'd probably agree to that. <laughs> but, but he's not wrong that technology changes everything. And if anyone is complacent or arrogant or think that because you have a big position today, you're going to have a big position tomorrow, that's a mistake. And, but then you have to define what is banking. Someone's going to have to hold the money. Someone's going to have to move the money. Someone's going to have to raise the money. Someone's going to have to do research you know, re, uh, about, around money. Those services will still be around. And, you know, hopefully we're doing it and using a lot of tech to do a better job at it. But I've always thought it's very possible that some tech thing, you know, disintermediates a piece of that. And I've been writing about, you know, big tech going to our business. We've got fintech, but we also have big tech. And they will embed payment systems in there. And some are going to white label banks, kind of what Apple did. Uh, you know, they have the right to do that. I'm not against that. I would be against unfair use of their position to dominate us in a business. Well, Apple I'm, is I'm, is going deeper into financial services. So no Do you question. worry about the bank of Apple? Well, I'm, I, we're going to compete, so they have a <laughs> they have a tough competitor. But you know, they hold money, move money. Yeah, they're a form of a competitor. You know, we also partner with them. But I'm very used to partnering and competing with lots of people. So, existential threat? I don't think it's an existential threat, but I think if we were complacent about it, yes. Mm -hmm. And you can watch that interview in full on The Circuit with Emily Cheng. It's on Bloomberg Television at 6 p.m. Wednesdays. So that's 6 a.m. Thursday if you're watching in Hong Kong. And coming up, TSMC is releasing its first quarter results later today. We discuss why analysts are expecting a rebound in earnings growth next. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at Micron shares in after hours here, you can see that, that pop that we've got there after we had a Bloomberg scoop out talking about Micron. It's poised to get over $6 billion in chip grants, possibly next week. That's what we're hearing from sources here. But Micron, as we know, is the largest U.S. maker of computer memory chips. And these, these grants would be to help pay for domestic factory projects. The award, as we say, not yet finalised, but it could come within the, the next several days. That's according to our sources. Uh, there have been a number of different companies that have benefited so far from the CHIPS Act. It's set aside nearly $40 billion for direct grants. There's also loans, loan guarantees that are in play. But officials so far have unveiled six preliminary awards and three to firms actually that produce older generation semiconductors plus multi-billion dollar packages uh, for the likes of Intel, Samsung and also, Heidi, TSMC. Yeah. 
And we're watching shares of uh, TSMC, of course, the world's biggest chip maker. They've more than doubled from their 2022 low as the company benefits from the AI boom. And full first quarter results due later Thursday could deliver more catalysts to drive that stock even higher. Let's bring our executive editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom, joins us now. And uh, Peter, what are these expectations? Well, the expectations for TSMC are quite high at this point. We're expecting the company to recover some, from some of the challenges that they've had in the past. Um, one of the issues that we're looking at very closely, though, is the earnings results we got out of ASML. ASML is the most important maker of the machines that actually fabricate chips. It sells a lot of those machines to uh, TSMC in particular and some of the other makers. And what we heard from ASML yesterday was a little bit concerning. Their revenue fell about 22 percent. Uh, also, the bookings, their advance, their, their forecast of what revenue is going to be in the future was much, much lower than expected, about 20 percent uh, shy of where it was expected to. So that's kind of raised concerns about how strong demand is from chip makers like TSMC to be able to buy these high-end machines and whether they're continuing to invest as aggressively as we've seen in the past. There are a bunch of things driving demand for chips right now, including you mentioned uh, AI in particular has been an inv a big investment area. NVIDIA is making the, the, uh, the AI chips that everybody wants right now. It really can't make them uh, fast enough, and TSMC fabricates those chips for these customers. So everybody thought that demand was going to be very strong. It was going to continue very strong. And what we heard from ASML yesterday was a little concerning on that front. So what do you think then for the outlook for, for TSMC? As you said, we've got these earnings that are coming out, question marks of whether that, that AI boom can extend. Uh, what does this mean and what's the likely reaction from investors when it comes to the share price? Yeah, well, one of the key things that uh, people will want to understand is uh, why uh, orders from Taiwan, those are almost certainly orders from TSMC, fell for ASML in particular, and whether TSMC is pulling back at all on, it, on its capital spending plans. Uh, it historically has invested about $30 billion a year in uh, CapEx, uh, a lot of those go to machines like uh, ASML's machines. So uh, the, the consensus has been that TSMC is going to invest very heavily so that it can build up additional capacity mm -hmm. in AI in particular and other kinds of new technologies. There's also this very interesting mm -hmm. geographic expansion going on. You mentioned Micron earlier. Chip makers are not only yeah. investing in these machines, but they're trying to do it across different countries like the US, Japan, and Taiwan. Yeah. All right, that was our executive editor for Asia Tech, Peter Elstrom.